All right, today I'm going to take a look at Circuit Maker, a new PCB design tool by Altium. This is a free community driven PCB design tool that has the same underlying engines as Altium Designer, their paid software, which is pretty much the industry standard. This PCB software, Circuit Maker, is absolutely free. It's all cloud based and it's aimed for hobbyists, students, and people who want to build circuit boards but don't have access to these other kinds of softwares. So let's get started. So this is the first screen you'll see after downloading and installing Circuit Maker, making an account and logging in. And yes, I know it's a little annoying that you have to log in to uh, use this software. So that means you need an internet connection to use it. But it's free, so we can't really complain too much, now, can we? One thing you'll notice is all these really cool looking community projects. If you want to load one and look at it, just click it, load over, and it'll come up over here. We'll talk about more about that later. But I'm going to show you how to make a new project from scratch. So you'll come down here and click New Project. Now, take some time to load, and it'll give you a name, description, options right here, and a selector between public and sandbox. And uh, sandbox is basically private, but you're limited to, I think, two sandbox projects before you have to make one of them public or delete one of them. But you can have as many public projects as you want. So I'm just going to work through a simple little project here that's going to be a 555 PWM generator circuit. And this circuit just uses a 555 timer to generate a PWM signal. And I'm going to let this be a public project. Actually, I already have a project called this because I've already finished it. So I'm going to call this 555PWM2 so I can differentiate. All right, and now I'm at this edit project page. I can add an image, change what type of project it is, the little stages of development, all kinds of cool stuff you can do here. Tags to help other people in the community find the project. I'm just going to go straight to work over here. So you'll see that uh, we've got this option to save. I'm going to go ahead and save and open the design. Okay, so over here on the left I have my new project 555PWM2 and I'm going to be basically recreating this project that I've already done here. Here's the schematic for it. You may have seen the circuit before. It uses a 555 timer and a couple diodes to uh, create a PWM signal. And I'm going to take you through how to make that. And in the end, we should have a board looks like this, and the famous Altium 3D rendering of it right here. I was really happy they included this feature in the free version because it's just fun. But that's what we should be building up to. So without further ado, let's get started. OK. So first, I'm going to close this old project that I already have finished by right-clicking on it and clicking Close Project. And no, I didn't make any changes. So now we're going to add a new schematic file to this new project. So we go up here to Project and click Add New Schematic. I'll just call it Sheet 1, the default name. All right, so now we're in Schematic Capture View. This is where we'll be adding components and creating our schematic for our project. So there's several different ways you can add a component. You can go up here and click Component. You can right click, click Place, and go to Component, or Type C. Or you can go over here to the Libraries view and start searching through this Octopart database, which will give you a list of all the available parts from all this Octopart library. This Octopart library references a bunch of different databases and uh, distributors like DigiKey, Mauser, those kinds of things. Uh, but not all of these will have footprints and symbols and we'll get into making those later if we need to. Alright, so I'm just going to go on here, place component, and I'm going to click choose and search for 555 timer. Alright, searching. Okay, so here 
we've got a bunch of results, all these different component names, and they're probably going to be different packages of the same part, different vendors and whatnot. So we're going to have to go through and figure out what's right for us. I want one that's going to be in a dip package. So I'm going to find one. Uh, this one says pdip. And it's got a little 3D view down here. So that looks right. Or it doesn't, it doesn't really matter which ones we choose. Uh, when we go through making our BOM, if we want to make a bill of materials, or and or do ordering directly from the software we have that option but I'm not going to do that so f for my purposes it doesn't really matter I'm just going to pick one that's dip 8 like this one okay and then click OK and place this on my schematic okay so now we've got our 555 timer IC alright before I add the rest of the components I'm going to go ahead and do a save it's good to save everything often because if something happens, your uh, program locks up or your, even just your internet crapping out, you can uh, lose a lot of progress because this is supposed to be a backup to the cloud continually and uh, there's no system in place to load from, uh, from your local machine if in the event of a crash or something. So I've had that happen to me a couple of times where something happened and my laptop crashed and I lost a lot of progress, so just be sure to click Save All often. All right, so let's add the rest of the components. Place, component, choose. Could add some diodes. I'm going to use 1N4148. One one Pretty common fast signal diode. Let's use that. Nice little 3D rendering there. Place a couple of those just out on the sheet. I'm going to connect it up later. All right, I need to add. Resistor. And I need to be through hole. All right, let's see what we have. Trimmer, carbon film. Here's a quarter watt resistor. All right, you'll notice that this doesn't have the same 3D image down here. There's just no 3D model for this part. So let me see if I can find another quarter watt that has a 3D model. If not, it doesn't really matter. We know what a resistor looks like. There's one. This will work well. Okay. And place that. Put that on the sheet. And I need some capacitors. So let's go up here. Capacitor. Let's see. I remember this being a little bit hard to find the right one. Uh, let's, let's give it a little bit more ceramic. And I mean to specify through hole. These are all mostly going to be uh, SMT parts, as you can see. And I'm looking for all through hole parts for this design. So let me put that in here. All right, so I don't need a huge high voltage capacitor like that. Let's see. This can be a little tricky and you'll find yourself spending a lot of time searching for parts and if this takes much longer I think I might pause the video until I find the right parts. Okay so what I'm going to do is go over here to the libraries browser here because this part is going to be a little harder to find and I'm going to type ceramic capacitor through hole and see what comes up. And in this view, not every part is going to have a footprint. So like for this example, it doesn't have the option here, place. It only has the option build. That means that there's the footprint and symbol and the library item there for that particular part hasn't been created yet. And if we really wanted to use this part, we could build it ourselves and it's not too difficult. But I'm going to look at, uh, this one has one, so I'm going to use this. This is 100 nanofarad and I need two of those, so I'm going to place these. And then I'm going to go back and look. All right, so this one right here, 10 nanofarads. I need one of those too, so I'll go ahead and place 
Okay, so we have our parts that we'll be using, with the exception of one part, the potentiometer. But uh, let me go ahead and grab that. Oops. Okay, so this looks nice. Hang on, where'd it go? And it's got a it's got a symbol and footprint associated with it. So I'm gonna grab that one and place it. All right, and now we're ready to actually start building our schematic. All right, you might notice these red lines under here, and that's errors being thrown because these have the same reference designator D question mark D question mark. So I'm gonna go through and change those. Call this D1, D2, and so on for all these parts. Just so we can tell them apart. And I'm doing that by double clicking on the reference designator and it pulls up this parameter properties window where I can edit some of these parameters. And there might be a way to get this to do it automatically, but I'm not sure. I'm actually going to call this pot. Okay, so now let's start building our actual circuit. I'm going to zoom out a little bit by doing a control and the scroll wheel out. Grab my two diodes. And I don't want the part number to be displayed like this. I'm just going to uncheck the visible marker here. Because I know what parts they are. I don't need to see it on the schematic. Uh, it just looks a little cluttered to me. But that's up to you. Mm -hmm. Don't need that. Actually, in the comment here, I'm going to put the value. This is a 10K. Make that visible. I let it go for some reason. All right, and I'm going to do the same thing on these capacitors. So these two are the 100 nanofarad. Actually, I'm going to write it in as 0 0.1 microfarad. Make sure it's visible. Okay. Same here. 0 0.1 microfarads. Okay. And this one is the 0 0.01 microfarad. Okay. And the pot value doesn't really matter as long as it's high enough that we don't get excessive current flowing here. So I'm just going to call it 100K. Okay, now to start actually wiring up the schematic. Start putting the components around where you want them. To rotate a component, you simply click it and hit space. There's probably other ways to do it. That's the easiest. And then just go ahead and start moving everything around to wire. You can type W, and it brings up these crosshairs. And then click point to point where you want the wires to be. You can also go up here and click wire in this ribbon. And then let's go ahead and build the circuit. All right, so I have the schematic wired up now, except for our power and ground connections. And you might be wondering, how do we do that? Well, I'm going to add connectors to the board for those later. But right now, I'm going to use power ports to designate which nets are our power and ground nets and whatnot. So first I'm going to grab ground, put those where I need them, and then I'm going to go ahead and grab a VCC. Here. And I'm just noticing a mistake here, so let's delete that wire. Pull this down. Oops, Control Z is undo. I'm sure everyone's familiar with that. Okay, I'm not sure why it's not letting me grab this as a group. Sometimes you might need to play with uh, these grid settings up here to get everything working well. 
I can go to where is it? Grids and uh, cycle through different snap grids, toggle whether they're visible, and uh, click set snap grid to change the grid size. It's a lot more crucial in layout than it is in schematic, but it can still help in schematic capture as well. Right. Okay, I've got the circuit wired up pretty much for the most part now. Probably want to clean it up a little bit if I was going to print, but should be good enough. And now I'm going to go ahead and add terminal blocks for connectors to this board. So we'll add component, choose terminal block. Let's see. No matches. Did I spell something wrong? Try screw terminal. Oh, I'm in favorites, that's why. Go to Octopart. Screw terminal. Alright, two position, five millimeter pitch. That should work. So I'm going to grab a couple of these. I'll accidentally place that there. Remove it. I'm going to call it. Power and signal. And I'm going to connect these to power and signal so we can get them off the board. Let's go ahead and add ground, power port, VCC. And then for signal, I want to connect this to this discharge net and let's have it pulled high here in case we're driving a transistor or something, whatever's happening outside of the circuit. Alright, so I'm going to go up to uh, place net label and label this net here. I'm going to call it uh, signal. Okay, and I'm going to do the same over here. should be both connected to the signal net. And there's other ways you can do that. You can use ports or buses or whatever, but I think that's just an easy way to do it with a net label. Also grab a net label up here for that. So now the schematic is pretty much done. We can go down here and put some uh, text boxes all right, Call fake engineer. And that should probably be in drawn by. And five 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 BWM. All right. All right, now to the fun part, the PCB. To make a new PCB, we go back to the project and click Add New PCB. Leave it at the default name. Okay, the first thing we have to do before we can start routing is define our board space. So go over here to Board, and I'm gonna click Edit Board Shape, and just make it a little smaller. Let's see here. It's not what I wanted to do. Okay, and then to see how small that is, or what size this is, I'm going to set this grid much higher. Okay, so now each of these major blocks is five of the minor blocks, making this 500, 500 mils across. So I'm going to go back and change the shape again. Okay, so that's one and a half by one and a half inches, which is pretty small, but I think it'll be enough. It might give us a little bit of a challenge on our routing. The next thing we need to do is place our parts. So to do that, 
we go up to project and import changes. Now oh, you can see here it's going to add all of these components and all these nets to the PCB. So I'm going to go ahead and click execute changes. It's taking a second. Okay, close. And now we see that it's placed all the parts next to our board. Now we need to figure out where on our board we want these parts. And I recommend spending most of your time on figuring out where to put the parts, because if you place the parts right, then routing should be easy. Well, easier. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. So I've gone ahead and placed everything, but before I get to routing, I want to show you a couple of things. One thing that's useful is if we go over here to view and help, see a list of shortcuts, and it'll automatically, oops, didn't mean to do that. It'll automatically click us to the category that we're in. So if I scroll down, I can see the uh, PCB shortcuts right here. And there are a ton of these, but most of them aren't that important since the ribbon bar at the top has all of these where you can just use the mouse. But some of the most useful ones, especially for routing right here, are the R key to switch to route mode, interactive route mode. And then Shift plus R changes which route mode we're in. I'm going to show that. And there's a couple more, just whatever you feel like you need. Uh, star over on the numpad, the multiply key, will switch what layer we're on. And we can actually do that while we're routing, and it'll automatically place a via for us to switch layers. And uh, yeah, these are very useful. So just have a look through. If you find that you're doing something with the mouse over and over again that you don't want to, you can take a look at the keyboard shortcuts. Some of the other things that are pretty universal, like control and scroll wheel changes the zoom. You've probably figured that out by now. Right click and drag moves it around in space. You can also use the scroll wheel without control or with shift to do up and down or side to side. And another cool thing is you might not these uh, capacitors don't have the square, the block around them, so you can, can kind of tell where they are just by clicking them or looking at the footprint. But if you happen to overlap something, it'll go red and tell you what's happening. So here we see these pads are overlapped and these parts are overlapped. It's, it's just not going to work. So it goes red and immediately brings your attention there to fix it. All right, so now what we're going to do is actually route the board. And what I mean by that is we're going to connect all the nets with a copper signal trace. And we can see here it has all these little rat lines to show you which nets connect where. And we're just going to follow those through and have this board. You could probably do this in a single layer, but I'm going to, uh, I'm going to, most fabs will let you use two layers unless you're going to do some kind of home etching process where one layer would be better. But I'm going to go ahead and make use of both layers, even though we could probably get away with only one on this simple of a design. So let's see. First, these look pretty straightforward, so I'm going to route these. I'm going to click R, and you can see the crosshair up here, which puts me in route mode. Click here, and go ahead. I'm going to write it down first. Click, cross, and clicking creates the actual copper. So now we can see that that, if I hit escape, that trace right here has been routed. And do the same thing on the other side. Click, push through. Uh, I want it to be symmetrical. So right there, click again, and boom, we're in. It escaped to leave that. And there it is. So we've got two signal paths right there, already routed, good to go. And you, you'll kind of get the hang of this. And if you need to, uh, if you route a trace and you need to move it, there's different ways you can do that. But if you just want to outright delete it, can select that segment. See now it's selecting just this segment, not the whole trace. Hit delete and go back here. Hit delete. Now the whole trace is gone. Pretty straightforward. Uh, routing modes. I mentioned that earlier. You can change them by clicking Shift and R, and you can see down at the bottom now I'm in push obstacles, hug and push obstacles. Stop at first obstacle. I can. That's pretty simple. It'll just stop. It won't let me route through an obstacle. Ignore obstacles. I think that's the default. That's what I usually leave it in because it's pretty obvious to see that if I 
tried to route here, that wouldn't work. But it's up to you what you want to use and what mode you want to have it in. Leave it to that. Okay, so that's back. And I'm just going to go ahead and, and do some routing. All right, so I've gone ahead and routed some nets, but you might notice that I haven't routed any of the ground nets here. So the reason I've done that is because I'm going to use a ground plane instead of connecting all these traces for a ground net. And the way to do that is you go up here to where it says Polygon 4 and click. And then I'm going to select top layer and connect to ground. And then click OK. And I'm going to go and click all four corners of the board. So I'm going to click there, pull out. There, there, and there. Okay, and then it creates this ground plane. And you can see that the ground nets have been connected to the plane with these little uh, thermal reliefs. And you can change the properties of these thermal reliefs or how many if you want more than four or different orientation or whatever. You can do that. But now I have this ground plane. But I personally don't like to route with the ground plane poured. So I'm going to go over here, select it, right click, go to polygon actions and click set all to unpoured. There. And now that polygon still exists, so the net lines for the ground planes aren't showing, but I don't have that big orange rectangle everywhere where I'm trying to route. Just per personal preference, you can route with them poured. It's not going to make a difference, but I think it looks a little nicer when I'm doing this. All right, so I've got almost everything routed in the top layer, but over here I have a little situation where these nets are crossing. So I'm going to have to go to the bottom layer for at least one of them and probably both because of this right here. So yeah, I'm going to have to go between layers on both of them. Uh, I could probably avoid this by rearranging the parts a little bit, maybe move the diodes around to where this line right here isn't blocking the, the IC from these connectors. I could, I could even just reorient the pot, but I think it's a good exercise because sometimes you can't get around these problems. Actually, probably always have to do something like this on a more complex board. So I'm just going to go ahead and show you how to do it. And we could do a little more planning and place our vias manual with this right here, but I'm going to go ahead and do it within interactive routing mode. So I'm going to click R and I'm going to pull this out and I'm going to carefully route it through here. And I might need to change. Yeah, I'm going to probably going to have to change where that is later because of uh, design rules. That'll probably be too close. And then over here, I'm going to switch to the bottom. So I'm going to go ahead and click the, push the star on the keyboard and it'll place it via. And then I'll click to place it. And I should be on the bottom layer now. And yes, I am on the bottom layer now. As you can see, the uh, trace is coming up in blue, which is the color for the bottom layer. And just pull that right around to where I want it. All right, so that's that one. And yes, yeah, see, it's already triggering the design rules. These are too close. I'm going to have to move that. So let's just put our snap grid down a bit. Let's go 10 mils. Zoom in and see if I can center it to where we still pass our design rule check. Let's see. How do I uh, select it? OK. Hit Escape. Yes, this. I guess it's a single click. It takes me a while to learn these things. Okay. Now I want the whole the whole trace. Shift click. I guess it's gonna make me do it in segments. Yes you. Okay, for some reason it's, it's switching me into these little tiny segments, which is really annoying. Probably something to do with the way I'm pulling these down. 
I see now I'm still getting uh, no I think that's that solved it because the trace isn't right anymore but we're gonna run through and do a design rule check at the end to make sure everything's up to spec there that looks pretty good I'm gonna leave it like that and now for the other one I'm gonna start on the bottom layer which is where I am click R I'm gonna pull it out over here until I am past all my obstacles and then I'm going to switch to the top layer by pressing the star on the keyboard placing the via now I'm back on the top layer and I finish routing this trace boom perfect alright so now the whole board is routed I can go ahead and set that polygon back to poured click on the edge Sometimes it's a little bit hard. Polygon actions, set all to poured. And all right, so we've got some design real problems here because the vias aren't showing up in our ground plane. So what I need to do is right click, polygon actions, rebuild. And this will change where the copper is so that everything's right. All right, so I have a couple of traces left. I guess I didn't see those. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap those because those are gonna be pretty straightforward. Click R, do this one in the top layer. Boom. Uh, make unpoured. And then this one is going to have to be in the bottom layer. Star. Okay. Rebuild those polygons. I'm still in interactive writing, so I'm going to hit escape. Let's see. Maybe I can do it from up here. Report all. There we go. Okay, so there's no ground plane on the bottom layer. I could do that if I wanted to. Um, I can show you that there isn't by switching to single layer mode. You can see in the bottom layer, there's only these three traces, so we're not really making good use of the bottom layer. If we wanted to move to a single layer design, we'd probably do that pretty easily. But I'm gonna check it out, make sure there's no mistakes. There probably are. So let's look at 3D. 3D is a good way to see if we made any mistakes. And it looks okay. I'm seeing one mistake and I knew it from the beginning, but I wanted to show the benefit of 3D. Or maybe that's a lie. Maybe I didn't know. But you can see that these terminal blocks are backwards. The wires plug in on this side, and we want the wires to plug in from the outside of the board. So I'm going to need to flip those and do some rerouting. But everything else looks okay, clearance wise. We don't have 3D models for these capacitors, but we know what capacitors are going to look like, and it seems to be all right. We got good clearance between everything. This is a little bit close here, but we should still be able to get our soldering iron in there, do the uh, IC first, and then the pot should be okay. Do the pot from the bottom. That's the beauty of 3D mode. We get to see everything. Might not have seen these mistakes before. Okay, so let's fix those mistakes. Switch back to 2D mode. I'm going to unpour this polygon. It's just my preference. And go ahead. I'm just going to disconnect these before I flip them. All right. Spacebar rotates. Do that. That's about right. All right, so our rat lines are a little different, but not too bad. I'm going to wrap this, pretty straightforward. And let's see, take this up, cross, back down. All right, perfect. Can repour polygon. 
Looks all right. Come back to 3D. Not sure how to reset this to the default view. I'm sure there's a way. Actually, it's probably clicking on these axes. Mm, view. good enough and now we can see that our wire terminals are actually facing the outside of the board so that's pretty good I think we're done with this like I said we probably could have done it in one layer but we got two available so why not and that's why I think that uh, placement of your components is more important than the actual routing in most cases especially for these little simple ones because if you place your components in the right spots Routing will be easiest, it'll be obvious where all the nets need to connect, and it should be okay. Sometimes you're better off avoiding things like we got a right angle right here, but since it's connecting to a pad, I don't think it's a big deal. And we're at a rel relatively low speed, so I don't think that net is even if that's our power, so that's not even our signal. And I have all these traces the same thickness. Just the default. If you were going to do a design where some traces are higher current or you had mains on this board, you'd have to do better clearance and thickness and whatnot. But since this is a low voltage, low current, low speed board, it doesn't really matter how we route it as long as everything's connected right. Like I said, this this works well on a breadboard, so it should work fine on a simple PCB like this. So yeah, that's that's about it for the routing. So next I'm going to show you guys how to save Gerber files for uploading to a Fabs website or having these manufactured. Generally need Gerber files for that. Sometimes you don't. Uh, Eagle will take uh, Eagle files. Will work at uh, one of the vendors I'm going to show you, but this is an Eagle, so we're going to have to we're going to have to output and maybe in the future. They might team up with a fabrication company like that, like Eagle has, but this is such a new software that nothing like that is in the works yet. All right. So here I've got two websites pulled up. This first one's for Advanced Circuits. They're a PCB manufacturer in Colorado, I think. And they had this deal, 33 each, $33 for each of your boards. I think you get like 60 square inches which is huge, but they charge the flat rate 33 for each board. You have to buy four, at least, to get this price, unless you're a student, in which case they'll let you buy just one board for $33, which makes it an incredible deal. And the turnaround time is really fast. It only takes about a week. You can look through here. They have a bunch of other options you can get, and they have this free DFM, which uh, checks your files against their design rules. So instead of going into the design rule checker in Circuit Maker and plugging in all of their design rules, you can just upload your files to this free DFM. And I suggest doing both, but if you wanted to skip the first one, you could go straight to the free DFM, make all your changes like that, and it should work out okay. And then over here, I have OSH Park. And they're another PCB board manufacturer in the US, uh, mostly hobbyists and students use this. It's much cheaper if you have a small board because they charge per square inch, $5 per square inch, and you get three copies, but uh, you only have to pay $5 per square inch. It's not five per square inch per copy. It's for all three. So that's a really great deal. Or $10 per square inch for a four layer board. And uh, it's a really great deal if you're doing a tiny board, like this one and a half by one and a half inch board would be very cheap. But the turnaround time is pretty slow. It takes, uh, what do they say here? Usually ships in 12 calendar days, so that's not terrible. But if you need it quicker, you can get next day from advanced circuits and they'll fab it. And as soon as it's done, they'll ship it. So those are some options. There's more out there. Seed Studio. Uh, there's some Chinese services you can get that take forever but have really good prices. So just do a little research and see what's best for your needs. But all of them will most likely need Gerber files. So to do that, you go up here to Outputs after you've finished your board, 
Uh, we can run a design rule check by clicking design rule check before we do this and looking at all our rules and you can enter in custom rules like uh, there's electrical which are like nets connected, short circuits, that kind of thing or uh, routing rules which are usually more um, routing and manufacturing rules are usually more important like uh, say we had a fab where our minimum hole size was limited we could go on here and click how do we do this? I'm trying to remember. I think you have to go to a different dialog. Um, here, define design rules. And then we could go in, find manufacturing, um, whole size, and we could change what the rules are. Right now we have a set minimum one mil. Maybe we can only do a minimum of 10 mils. Set that. Click apply, OK, and it'll add it to your design rules. I'm just going to leave it at the default. You should click it, click run, and it should be OK. Let's see what these are. OK, so I've still got uh, rules loaded in from advanced PCV that look like they're uh, being violated right here. We could go through and see what they are. There's some. Uh, uh, trace and top overlay clearances. Usually that kind of thing where it's top overlay or silk screen or solder mask like right here, this U1 is overlapping here. Usually it's not a problem. No, actually that wouldn't be a problem, but say I had C2 or I move this U1 right here to where it's on top of a hole here. Usually the house can take care of that. The, uh, the fabricators can can take care of that, but it'll still throw a, a design rule violation. So it's up to you how I suggest going after all of them and trying to track them all down, but usually stuff like that can be taken care of. So here it's off the board and it's warning me that this will not be printed. No big deal. I could I could even just delete that if I wanted to. So that's design rule checking. And you should do that before you export. But some manufacturers will do it on their end too and let you know if they can't build something right. So to export, you go over here to Gerber, click it, it's telling me I need to save, and then alright, those files. Alright, and then it'll let you set up you know, what kind of format, units, which layers, how they're going to do drills, apertures, and other kind of things. And your manufacturer will have a list of uh, how they want their Gerber set up and then click OK and it'll tell you where to save the zip folder with all your Gerbers in it. Then you'll probably need to do a drill file as well. Most most of them need both same kind of dialogues. Take it through your options and it'll tell you where to save it. And then you can upload those to your manufacturer and if they have a design rule checker of their own they'll run that and give you a report and then they'll fabricate your board and send it to you. And that's about it. There's a lot more to this that I'm not going to go into that you can explore. Like I said, this help has a lot and they have documentation on their website that you can read through. It's really good. And say that we wanted to add 3D parts for here, we could read up on their documentation on how to do that. Maybe pull some 3D models off the web for our capacitors. But I'm going to stop it here. I think you guys got the gist of it. And I'm going to be posting this to my blog, so if you have any questions, you can ask me or search through the help and ask on the their forums would probably be better. And all right, I hope this wasn't too boring. It's my first time doing a video like this, so I know it's going to sound boring. I'm not good at this, but my professor asked me to make a video, so I went ahead and did it. All right, hope you enjoyed this. and. You learn something.